there. So our lesson today is is fairly quick. There's there's one theorem uh, that we're going to talk about, and then I'll have you guys essentially do an around the room practice um, some stations just to gear up for a test that's in a, a class or two. Uh, so <clears throat> continuity leads us to this theorem called the intermediate value theorem. And just like in geometry, where you had to do proofs and you had to know the names of the theorems, like, uh, oh, what are some theorems that you guys do in there? Oh, I don't even know off the top of my head. But you guys had to know the names of them, and then you had to know what they said, and then you had to use them uh, in your proofs, like vertical angles theorem, ha, got one, and things like that. In this class, you're going to be given theorems. There's not a lot of them that you guys are going to have to memorize. Uh, but there are a few, and not only do you have to know what they say, but you have to know what they're called, like what their names are, and you have to know the conditions that have to be met to use them. So again, I don't have a note outline, um, but this is the start of the intermediate value theorem, and I want you guys to go ahead and jot this down on either notability or, or a piece of paper. And all I have here are the conditions to the theorem. Okay, It's always, fo it's always important to focus on the conditions. So the intermediate value theorem says... If f is a continuous, I should say, if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, so you have to have a continuous function, and k is any number between f of a and f of b. Now, f of a and f of b are y values. So, a, b, right here, those are x values. f of a and f of b are the y values at those endpoints. So, you need a continuous function on a closed interval, and you need a y value between the y values of the endpoints. Those are the conditions that have to be met. And then let's talk about the conclusion after you write that down. Well, here's what has to be true. There's at least one number, c, so some x value, in the closed interval, such that f of c equals k. And just try to write that down, but also try to think about it. You have a continuous function on a closed interval, and you have a y value between the y values of the endpoints of the interval. So k is between f of a and f of b. There is at least one number, so there's what they're saying is there's some x value in this interval, where if you would plug that x value into the function, you would get that k value. Now, this is, once I show it, pretty intuitive. Um, but you have to know what the conditions say, and you have to know what the conclusion is, is talking about. This is also known as what's called an existence theorem. This theorem is not going to help you find anything. I, I will say that, okay? All this theorem is saying is that it's, so, it's going to happen, but it doesn't help you find it. We'll talk about finding it here when we do an example. So here's what it says. Actually, I'm just going to draw a graph instead of pulling that down. So if I have, I'm going to set up the conditions. And I'll just focus on the first quadrant. So we have a closed interval A to B. And we have some function continuous on the closed interval. So we're going to call this point right here F of A. That's what Y values are. If I would plug A into the function, this Y value is F of A. And if this is B, then we have f of b. All right? And we're going to draw a continuous function. Now, it doesn't matter if we just connect these two. It doesn't matter. Or if we go just like this. Or if we put a whole bunch of humps in there. It doesn't matter as long as it's continuous from one endpoint to the other. And now we need some k value between f of a and f of b. And what this theorem says is if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, as I do right here, and you pick any y value between the y values of the endpoints, then there has to be some x value in here that if you would plug it in to the function, you'll get that y value, that well, that k value. And you could see it. Like right here, it would be this x value. There would be our c value right there. there it's going to happen. Essentially what it means is, in other words, if you want to jot this down, basically there is an x value between a and b that has a y value between f of a and f of b. 
That's really what it's saying. There's some x value that corresponds to some y value between f of a and f of b. In other words, what it's saying is you can't jump from this point to this point without going through all of these y values in between. Because that's what means you need, you need to have a continuous function. That's why the continuity matters. If we had a non-continuous function, say I had something like this. Say I break a condition. I always talk, think about breaking a condition. Why do they say all these conditions have to be met? Well, if I had a and b here, let's say I did this. So I went here, stopped it, started it here, went like this. Okay, so you have f of a, you have f of b. I'm going to pick a k value here. Now notice, for this particular k value, there's not an x value that corresponds with it. The graph doesn't exist there. That's because this graph is not continuous. That's why those conditions matter. You need a continuous function in order to meet this condition. Now it just says there's at least one. So I have this here. Notice there's many. If I pick this y value, well, this x value corresponds with it. This y x value corresponds with it. And so does this one right here. So there's multiple x values that could correspond. But again, this is an existence theorem. It's just saying it's going to happen. And this is called the intermediate value theorem. Okay? So let's do an example. And then you guys can do the around the room practice. All right. So it says, verify the intermediate value theorem applies to the indicated interval and find the value of C guaranteed by the theorem. So here's all the information given to you. Okay, here's the problem. So go ahead and write this out. Verify the intermediate value theorem applies to the indicated interval and then find the value of C guaranteed by the theorem. I'll let you jot all that down and then we will go to work. Okay, that's really a two-part question when we do this. Two parts. The first part says, verify the theorem applies. What that means is we have to prove that the conditions are met. Okay, We have to prove that the conditions are upheld. So let's think about what the conditions are to the intermediate value theorem. We need our function to be continuous on the closed interval from A to B. So let's see if, if we have that. Okay. Do we have a continuous function in this interval? So think about this function here. There's only one number excluded from the domain. There's only one number where this would not be continuous, and that would be at 1. When x equals 1, this function wouldn't be continuous. But that doesn't matter because 1 is not in the interval that we're talking about. 1 is not between 2.5 and 4. So the only number that this function wouldn't be continuous at is at 1, and that's not in the interval we're talking about, which means condition 1 is met. f of x is continuous on the closed interval from 5 halves to 4. Condition 1 is met. Condition 2 says the y value in question needs to be between f of a and f of b. So our y value that's in question here is 6. We need 6 to be between the y values of these endpoints. We need to verify that. That's condition 2. Verify that our y value is between the y values of these endpoints. So we don't need this y value to be between these numbers. We need it to be between the y values of these numbers. Well, how do you find the y values of those numbers? Well, you plug each of them into the function. So 2, let's find f of 5 halves and f of 4. And remember, when it says a pro whenever a problem says verify, that means it is true. If a problem says verify, or prove, or justify, or show, they just want your math to, sh to, to prove it to be true. So this should happen. So you can take your calculators, and I fully know that you guys can plug these numbers in. So I'm just going to give these values to you. This is 5.833, and this is 6.667. One thing that's important to note, I always like to give just little AP tips, 
Um, on the AP exam, on free response questions, you are required to go out to three decimal places. You lose your point. If you're doing a problem and on the answer you put 5.83, you would not earn that point. You have to go to at least three places. You can go more, but you have to go to at least. And what they also allow you to do for that third decimal, you can either round it if needed or truncate. What that means is if you would look at the fourth decimal, like this would be 6.66666, since the fourth one is five or higher, you can either round this third one up or you can actually just cut it off at three places. Like if you got a decimal that was like 3.28888, you can actually just slice off those last two and put 3.288 or you could put 3.289. They'd actually accept both but you do have to go to three places. And you'll find out when we take our first quiz or first test, when you don't go to three places and I take off, you'll get mad, but you'll, you'll get the point. Um, I try to grade, when I grade our tests and quizzes, as hard, if not harder, than what the AP graders will grade, just so that you guys are doing things appropriately and not losing points for silly things like that. I don't agree with it, but it is what it is. All right, so we now have shown that 6 is in between these. You might want to write a little statement that 5.833 is less than 6, which is less than 6.667. Just again showing that our y value in question is between the y values of the endpoints. So our two conditions are met. We have a continuous function on the closed interval, and 6 is between the y values of the endpoints. So that's part one of the question. We have now verified it. So we could say, therefore, Intermediate value theorem applies. That three dots stands for therefore, just shorthand. Now part two of the question. Since it applies, that means there has to be some x value in this interval that if we plug into this function, we get six. Has to be true. We've just proven that has to be true. So it says find the value of c that is guaranteed by the theorem. So we essentially need to figure out what x value makes this become 6? So set the function equal to 6 and find out. So 6 equals x squared plus x over x minus 1. We're trying to find the x value that makes this true. So we have to be good at solving equations. Multiply both sides by x minus 1. That clears your fraction. We have a quadratic, so let's go ahead and set this equal to 0. That should be second nature. So I'm just going to move everything to the right side. So 0 equals x squared minus 5x plus 6. Just move everything over to the right or left, doesn't matter. I like to keep x squared positive. And you can use quadratic formula or factor. I'll factor. So x equals 2 or 3. However, here's where you need to be careful. Most of the problems we deal with uh, in calculus contains intervals that we're working in and we need to make sure that our answers are in the interval notice the question said find the value of C guaranteed by the theorem guaranteed by the theorem the theorem just says there's going to be an X value in this interval that equals 6 notice 2 is not in the interval 2 is not an X value that was guaranteed by the theorem yeah 2 is an X value that makes the function equal 6 but that's not what the question asked it said find the value guaranteed by the theorem. And so that one would have to be 3 because 3 is inside of the interval. So always pay attention to intervals that are given. And I have all that worked out right here. Where this helps, you know, you always wonder, well, what does this matter? Where this does come into play, it, it's helpful to identify where you have zeros or x-intercepts. So, for instance, if you have a continuous function, and you know that on, you know, let's call it G, if G of A is negative and G of B is positive, then there has to be some X value between A and B that corresponds with an X intercept. Um, so it could be helpful in narrowing down where X intercepts exist. That's just kind of a benefit of it. What I'd like you to do now is work on that around the room. Uh, I think you'll get to practice this once or twice on that around the room, but also everything to do with limits.